technical details. Um, there's a little bit on the slide, but I'm not going to dwell on that. I mainly want to give you perspective about how public key came to be, what overall problem it solves, and, uh, and so forth. And um, some of the his historical background, which is not as well known. And um, this gave me a laugh. Here's our, our outline. Um, this gave me a laugh because uh, brink of a revolution um, also struck me just like it struck Jill Piper <laughs> last night. <laughs> I like that line as well. Uh, it's my favorite first line of a paper. Um, and it's a great paper. So anyway, I'll talk about introduction, early history, and uh, network security in the traditional sense before public key, and also the role of public key in key management, which is its main application, and uh, digital signatures, certificates. These are words you've probably heard. You might not know yet what they are. Um, something about cryptographic hash and um, the underlying math problems, which underpins security of, of much public key or factoring and discrete log. Then we have uh, elliptic curve cryptography, a few words. Identity-based cryptography is something, um, kind of an interesting side topic, which I, I would bet that most of you haven't heard of before, but it's very interesting. And uh, a few references. And then after these slides, I'm going to give elliptic curve background, finally. So um, just basic group law, which you really uh, probably are dying to know by now, because you've seen the elliptic curve so often. What are they? Uh, OK, and you're all secretly insecure about. <laughs> uh, so um, public key cryptography is um, not is a pretty recent development, relatively speaking, historically. Uh, it made its debut in the 70s and 80s. And its main role, as you probably know, is to enable a secret conversation between people who have no shared key, no shared secret key, even in the presence of eavesdroppers. If you think about it, how on earth could you do that? You know, you're talking with your friend on the phone, and someone's listening to every word you say. And you kind of just say all these numbers back and forth, and your friend, everything is listened to, and then suddenly you go secret. It's like, what? You know, that they've listened to every word you've said, and you can, you can actually go secret. So it's pretty amazing. It uses um, one-way functions in novel ways, and lots and lots of number theory. Um, it's also the basis now for internet security. Uh, for example, HTTPS that we see all the time. So uh, further, it's used for all kinds of applications, public key encryption, digital signatures, authentication, message integrity, non-repudiation, crypto distribution, contract signing, electric commerce, smart cards, digital cash. Um, it's just a huge number of applications. And uh, the hard math problems that underlie public key are factoring, discrete log, over finite fields, elliptic curve discrete logs, um, other kind of discrete log problems too. Certain lattice problems, um, I probably, there may be something I've overlooked, there may be others, but the security of public key derives from the computational complexity of these problems and really the number, th number theorists and mathematicians and um, uh, uh, people with expertise in algorithms are really well positioned to most, to best uh, understand these types of problems. So. Um, we have jobs. <laughs> Yay. So uh, some early history, um, 1970 to 76, uh, researchers at Britain's equivalent of NSA, uh, GCHQ, they discovered non-secret encryption, which is now known as public key cryptography. And it was rediscovered in 76 to 77 in the academic career community by, uh, uh, with, uh, by Diffie and Hellman and um, they also applied it to uh, network security. Um, so here is Ellis's paper, his um, abstract, and I actually got permission from GCHQ that I can put this, this slide up. So um, January 1970, the, uh, the possibility of 
secure, non-secret digital encryption. Summary, this report considers the problem of achieving secure transmission of digital information in the circumstances where there is no information initially possessed in common by the two legitimate communicators, which is not also known to the interceptor. So quite an interesting question. What were his motivations? Well, he came across a 1944 Bell Telephone Laboratory report. Um, two people want to commu communicate secretly over a wire, analog signals like sines and cosines. Uh, they do not share any secret ahead of time. And the trick they used was the recipient adds noise to the channel, and then the message is transmitted on top of the noise. So now an eavesdropper sees noise. The recipient knows what noise was added. They can subtract it and get the actual message. So this is a great idea. And Ellis's goal was, well, can we do something similar for digital? Um, obviously, this exact idea won't work. If I send a bunch of zeros and ones, they're going one direction, and the message would come the other direction. How, how would this work? So uh, he did, though, recognize the recipient has to be active in the encryption process one way or another. Otherwise, they'd be in the exact same situation as the eavesdropper. And um, authentication is an issue. So you have to ask, if, if you're not sharing any secret information, the sender and recipient, how do you know that you're not talking to Eve? So that's, that's another question which, which uh, had to be considered. Um, but that, we'll ignore that last question for now. So here is Ellis's heuristic model. The recipient has to be active. So what they'll do is they will uh, generate a random number, k, and send m1 of k to the sender, where m1 is a one-way function. And he didn't have an idea how to make that one-way function. So this is just a proof of concept. Uh, the sender incorporates m1 of k into the encryption. And then the decryption should be easy if you know k. That would be because the recipient needs to decrypt. They, they're the ones who have k. But it should be hard if you only know m1 of k, because that's what Eve sees, the eavesdropper. Um, so this was 1970. 1973, Cliff Cox comes up with the following solution. And, um, uh, he says, well, let's take k to be two large primes, p and q. Let's take m1 of k. Let's just take p times q is n. And so then the message is some number. You, you embed the number as an integer mod n. Um, and the cipher is m raised to the n power mod n. So this is like RSA, but he just used only one encryption exponent, which is capital N. And actually, that works fine. Decryption is easy if P and Q are known in hard otherwise. Um, when we do Emily's exercise exercises, you'll see how the decryption works. And I think many of you have already been exposed to RSA, so you may have already seen it. Uh, so Cox's system is now known as RSA. And um, I often just call it Cox RSA. Um, the security is based on the difficulty of factoring n. So there's a number theory problem. How do you factor n? Right? OK. Then um, the following year, 1974, Malcolm Williamson, also GCHQ, had the following idea. Suppose that two encryption algorithms commute with one another. And so let them call them EA and EB. Um, and then let DA and DB be the corresponding decryption algorithms. And suppose that the EA and DA are known only to the sender. So this is not quite public key. This is a little different. And EB, DB are known to the recipient. Um, OK. So the sender encrypts their message, EA of M, just encrypting the message. The recipient 
super encrypts. So it's now EB times EA of M. Then the sender decrypts, puts on their decryption. And finally, the recipient puts on their decryption. And since these things commute, the recipient actually sees the message. Kind of cool, as long as you don't worry too much about Eve. Um, so how, how, do, how would you instantiate this? Well, he said uh, EA could be exponentiation in a, in a finite field. And um, then to decrypt, you just have to compute the, the inverse of that. So, um, which, which amounts to finding the inverse of A mod Q minus one, where Q is the size of the field. The discrete log problem would break this. Um, given M and M to the A, compute A. If you could solve that discrete log problem, you would break the system because the first thing the sender says, sends is, uh, um, well, let's see. No, what is the reason? Um, because you are seeing M to the A going across, you're also seeing M to the AB going across. So if you solve the log of M to the A against M to the AB, you would find B and break the system. So, um, so the discrete log problem is uh, what underpins the security of the system. <laughs> Um, a then we have um, the key agreement idea. Uh, so Williamson had an improvement to this idea in, in 1976, um, which was that it's computationally expensive to exponentiate in, uh, in a Z mod NZ star or Z mod PZ star using the technology of the time. And so it's impractical to encrypt long messages with public key cryptography. So he had the idea to, to do key agreement instead. So here's how that works. You're gonna use this same idea as before, but uh, only to the extent of coming up with a shared secret. Once you have that shared secret, then pull out your favorite fast algorithm at, for encryption and use that to encrypt the long message. So uh, the way this works is you agree on a field and a generator, and now the sender has a secret um, little a, and they just send g to the a across. The recipient has a secret b, they send g to the b across, and then the crypto variable is g to the ab, which both are able to compute. The eavesdropper, what are they seeing? They see the field, the generator, g to the a and g to the b. If they could solve the discrete log, they would be in. And so again, the discrete log problem is essential to the security of the system. Okay. Ah, <laughs> our, our favorite literature. Um, we stand today on the brink of a revolution in cryptography. And he's talking about the, 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 the fact that cheap digital hardware has now come on board. This is what, how many years are we after the Enigma, by the way? We're about 30 years after the Enigma. So, okay. Uh, so at this point, cheap digital hardware has freed it from the design limitations of mechanical computing. Remember Enigma. Um, and, uh, and brought the cost of high-grade cryptographic devices down to where they can be used in commercial applications. Remote cash dispenser, I mean, we didn't have them back then. There was no ATM machine. Uh, there were long lines at the bank on Saturday mornings, I remember that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and computer terminals. Um, in turn, such applications create a need for new types of cryptographic systems, which minimize the need for secure key distribution channels and supply the equivalent of a written signature. So all this is just imagination at this point, but wow. At the same time, theoretical developments in information theory and computer science 
show promise of providing provably secure crypto systems, changing this ancient art into a science. Mm, I like that. Okay. Uh, so traditional network security uses um, electronic, boy, traditional, like from today's perspective, this is traditional. Electronic code books, very fast and sleek. Um, really, this is like mid-70s. So encryption and decryption keys are the same in that, oh wait, I'm sorry, that, yeah, encryption and decryption keys are the same. That's called the crypto variable. Um, I will say for AES and triple DES, you do have the same key for encryption and decryption, but a uh, different algorithm. So it is no longer true that encryption equals decryption. It's, it's just that the same key will work on both sides. So there's one algorithm for encryption and a separate algorithm for decryption using the same key. So this is called a symmetric key um, method. And the, the idea of them is you sort of just scramble things up very quickly by um, mixing, mixing modes of operation or using uh, S-boxes and various techniques, Feistel, um, a lot of techniques that I don't have time to get into, but they're, uh, they go very, very, very rapid. And now the problem is key management. How do you securely deliver the crypto variable to the parties in a network who wish to communicate? Um, in World War II, they would deliver these daily keys in the code book but um, we want something which will, uh, where you don't have to do so much physical, you don't need a physical courier to do this. You want it to be more automated. So um, old fashioned way, you had a trusted authority who we, we like to call Trent, and Trent has a shared secret key with each member of the network. If Alice and Bob want to communicate, they contact Trent. Trent's always available and um, says, okay, I'm making a crypto variable and I have, I have a secure, I, have, I share a key with Alice and I share a key with Bob. So I just give Alice the session key, give Bob the session key, and now Alice and Bob can talk. Okay, um, so one issue with this is that when you have n users, you have about n squared pairs of users. So Trent, uh, Trent's work grows quadratically, yeah. Yes, that's another point. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is why trusted. <laughs> All right, then, um, I mean, that can, that can work still very well, like if you have a corporation or something, they just. Um, so PKC and key management, um, we have O of N squared pairs of users, public key, gives you an O of N method for key distribution. And that improves over the traditional methods, which are O of N squared. So um, public key can be used for encryption. You could actually encrypt a message with RSA, but that's not its true calling. Uh, it's slower and more cumbersome than electronic code books. The real strength of PKC for networks is the key management. That, that's, the, that's the point. So with public key encryption, um, Alice and Bob can, share a sec can communicate secretly without sharing a crypto variable, but Eve could insert herself into a communication channel and pretend to be Bob or pretend to be Alice. And then how is, how are they gonna know? Um, you know, Eve can make up her own private public key and, and then kind of say, I'm Bob and here's my public key and she has the private key. So um, we don't want that. So we need some kind of process at some point where people actually physically identify themselves and register. Because uh, otherwise you can't tell Eve from anybody else. So, uh, this is to avoid man in, in the middle. Alice has to, at some point, go prove her uh, physical identity to Trent, and in return, Trent will give her a public key certificate that mathematically links her physical identity with her public keys. 
And this registration process has to be done once for each user. So if there are n users, it's O of n to, to register everybody. It's done once. And uh, so now a tool for key management is the digital signature. Um, and the digital signature, it's a pair of algorithms, S for signing, V for verifying, and um, the V is public, S is private. Only the possessor of the S algorithm, the signing algorithm, can produce a valid signature, but anybody who, uh, anybody can verify using the public verification algorithm V. Uh, so example is RSA digital signature. Um, let E of M and D of M be RSA encryption and decryption. So the signed message will be the message together with sigma, where sigma consists of first you hash the message. Remember the hash is a one-way function. After that, you decrypt the hash with your RSA key. And only the holder of the RSA private key could do that. Nobody else could decrypt. So then, um, and H is public. H is the, uh, the hash function. It's a one-way function that's quick to compute and hard. You can't invert it. You can't find collisions uh, computationally. So verification, how do you verify that? You take sigma and you encrypt it with, pub, with the RSA public encryption algorithm. You encrypt sigma and you check, is that equal to H of M? So you encrypt sigma, you hash the message, and you compare those results. So that's a public verification method. Um, with a, and, and the only person who should be able to uh, create a valid signature is the person who knows P and Q. So that, that's a very nice idea for um, digital signature, and that's in the uh, Diffie and Hellman paper, I think. Um, okay. How do we use digital signatures to avoid man in the middle attacks? Um, so we kind of have the same conundrum is what, how about if Eve makes up <laughs> her own signature and verification algorithm and says, hey, Bob, this, hey, Alice, I'm Bob, and here's my signature. We have the same problem. So um, Trent has his digital signature, STVT, and, um, and the verification algorithm is installed on everyone's computer. So now everyone can verify whether a message is really from Trent, okay? That's just one thing you've got to, that everybody needs is Trent's public verification for, for signature. If that's distributed, now Alice, she, ha she has her own digital signature and um, she goes to Trent. Now her verification algorithm, Alice is less important than Trent and her verification is not installed on everybody's computer. So she goes to Trent and um, she shows Trent her driver's license and in return, Trent creates a certificate which says, um, it links, the certificate links her identity to her encryption key um, and also to her public signing key. So the purpose of this certificate is to link her identity with her public keys. She keeps her private keys to herself. All right, then Alice's certificate consists of the message together with Trent's signature of the message, where the message is just the information containing her name and her keys and whatever else you wanna put there, date, whatever. So now when Alice gives Bob her certificate, he verifies it was signed by Trent and um, 
and then concludes that, yeah, that signification, that, that uh, verification algorithm really does belong to Alice. I'm convinced of that. So now when Alice signs, uh, sends a message and sends a message and she signs it, um, he says, yeah, that message really is from Alice. Yeah, question. In terms of like implementing stuff, something like this, uh, who is Trent? Um, well, you know, Trent has to be trusted. And so it, it would um, be determined by standard bodies or uh, if you're talking about an internal system, it would be somebody in corporate headquarters. You, you do need somebody in charge and um, uh, you know who who people agree can serve as a trusted authority there uh, there are secret secret sharing techniques so um, you can split secrets between more than one party there's a whole slew of techniques in that arena so yeah um, my, yeah my question is about the previous slide okay um, Um, so, so here, the signature is the decryption of the hash, right. and so the signer can compute that, right? No, no, I'm, I'm talking about like communicating the ESD, or they both the identity. She, she's talking about communicating. Like the inverse of the hash? Oh, you don't, you don't no, retrieve. Not the hash, just the ESD. Okay, so only, only the. Um, Pers the signer is the only one who knows how to decrypt with RSA? Like my point, right. If you do E of sigma, mm -hmm. right, you're doing E of Z. Okay, right. Of the hash, right? That's right. And that's the identity. Yeah. Okay. E composed so with D. Usually you would do D composed with E. That's right. But they're both the identity, right? So like encryption and decryption are inverses on both sides. That's right. But um, for the purpose of signature, you're trying to prove that this right, is right, your right. message. Yeah. Yeah. And so you. We need a method in which encryption and decryption on, are inverses on both sides for this to work. You mm -hmm. can imagine a scheme where it works only in one direction. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, okay. you can encrypt first and then decrypt, but you can't decrypt then. Oh, I, I think I understand what you're, what you're getting at. So when you have um, like Diffie-Hellman based things, your, your secret um, is, uh, you, the, the holder of the secret can't do discrete logs. Whereas in this case, the holder of the secret can actually right. invert. Well, okay. But like e anyway. is easier. Okay. Um, I think there was another question, yeah. That would be depending on how it's set up, okay. um, you know. So yeah, it it certainly depends, and and I think typically the there are definitely problems with the user being the only one who knows the private key is what if they lose it. Okay. <laughs> you, you you probably want some kind of key recovery. Okay. So, but if if you're interested in that in that type of uh, network of trusts and so forth, you you know you should look into secret sharing algorithms and things like that. There are many, many ways to distribute trust across multiple um, entities and so forth. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, okay, you, you've asked a wonderful question and it's a huge can of worms. How do you do certificate revocation in case of lost keys or uh, compromised keys and, or, or a user who you don't want on your network anymore 
and so it's a huge can of worms, and um, I'll leave probably. I think you can do that with secret sharing, but like if you go to these websites like Amazon, you check the, the lock symbol and the details, and it says like VeriSign has this certificate until 2019 or something, but does that mean they will not, that, that means they're capable of maintaining their information until then? Or? Um, you, the, they have expiration dates because at some point you want to wipe the system clean and, and get people refreshed. So, yeah. Right. Okay, any other questions so far? Okay. Uh, all right, now how do Alice and Bob talk? Um, they do not need to wake up Trent. Trent gets to s sleep all night long because they, they're not going to need Trent anymore. Um, he j he's given them their certificates and now they're, they're good to go. So uh, let's say e EADA are Alice's encryption decryption keys, SAVA are her signing and verification keys. The encryption and signing, the encryption and verifications are public. The decryption and signing are private. Um, and she has a certificate, C, C sub A. Likewise for Bob, but with B's. So Alice wants to send Bob a secret message so um, first they exchange certificates. So now, then they verify each other's certificates and they're both, they both now um, are convinced that the public keys belong to who they think they belong. Eve tries to send something but she doesn't have Trent's cer certificate so she's stuck. All right, Alice and Bob, um, so they verify. Now Alice sends Bob, she takes the message she signs the message, concatenates those together, and then she encrypts the whole shebang with Bob's public key. Um, Alice is seeing something encrypted with Bob's public key. She, I'm mean, sorry, Eve is seeing something encrypted with Bob's public key. He has no idea, right? Uh, so then Bob, he takes this thing, decrypts the whole thing, and then he checks the signature of the message with Alice's public verification key. So he's happy and that it came from Alice and that the message really is signed by her and so forth. And so he replies with uh, the, uh, the similar sort of thing, but with A and B reversed. And Alice does a similar thing that so they, now they have a, a secret conversation. Yay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Do we go from the assumption that Eve doesn't have a certificate for a trans verification violation? That, that the, encryption, uh -huh. the encryption algorithm um, has a public key that's included on the certificate. If you, if you have a certificate, if Eve has oh, if Eve has, if Eve has Alice's or her Eve has Eve's certificate, oh, oh, okay, Eve can um, can 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 talk to Alice and say hello, I'm Eve. And if Alice wants to answer and have a conversation with Eve, she can. But if Eve can't go and say hi, Alice, I'm Bob, that won't go over, because Trent won't give her any kind of certificate saying that she's Bob. Um, Eve can see the certificates. That's public knowledge. But like, can she somehow get it and then pretend to be Alice if she has? Um, she, can, she cannot pretend to be Alice because she doesn't have Alice's private keys. So if she tried, she, if her, her problem would be that she cannot produce a, a valid message and signature pair. Eve can't do that because she doesn't have the private signing algorithm of Alice. She only has Alice's verification algorithm. Mm -hmm. So it just fits together. It's com kind of complicated, but it actually fits together and gives you uh, a, a, a formulation for network security with um, key distribution that can be done over long distances. And, uh, okay, now um, we've mentioned the cryptographic hash. I think that came up on 
Tristan's lecture as well. Um, we use the hash for signing messages. We use it to prove a message has not been altered. Um, it's an easily computed function that takes as input a string of any length and as output it produces a fixed length. For example, maybe 64 bytes. A cryptographic hash function has to be, uh, it should be publicly known, um, publicly accepted, and collision-free, non-invertible, and an example is SHA-512. Um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, SHA. It's a commonly known hash function. If H is not used um, in, in a signature, then Eve could create a fake signed message by making up a random signature. She makes up sigma, just randomly selects it, and she, she then creates a message, which is E of sigma. And now she, she sends Bob EB of M sigma. Well, the signature veri verifies correctly, because what is she going to do? They're going to take, um, take M, take a, they're going to encrypt sigma and see if it's equal to M. Well, it is. So it, it'll, it'll fool into looking like Alice's signature. So this is why the hash is needed. The only thing about this is her message will look like gibberish, because it's just the encryption of a random number. But anyway, um, we don't want that to happen nonetheless. And uh, so we really want non-repudiation. We want Alice to be the only one who could ever create a valid signature. And so that's why we, we use a hash. And the other advantage of using a hash is a message might be really, really long, but the hash has fixed size, so it's more efficient to just always have the, um, the uh, signature have a fixed size rather than possibly being as long as the whole message. So, so that's the reasons for hash function. And uh, the, the design of a hash function is just really, really fast. It just swaps things around, uses, it's kind of similar to the type of thing that, that you use for creating code books. It's just a whole bunch of <coughs> rounds and um, move bits around a lot, uh, lots of create entropy really quickly. So um, I'm not gonna go into the details of uh, designs of hash functions. Factoring and discrete log problem. Um, I think you've seen this in the other lecture. There's, uh, there's a notion L of C, which measures complexity. And the, the formula for L of C is given below. So if, let's say we're interested in factoring N. And you say, well, what's the complexity of factoring N? And this is the definition of, of a complexity formula. You say, my algorithm is L of a half, or my algorithm is L of a third. It means that you put in C equals a half, or C equals a third into this formula. Um, so note that log N is, represents the space needed to represent the problem, essentially. So for example, if N is 100 million, you, you need only nine amount of space, it, it, you know, O of log N digits. So in some sense, log n is the problem size in terms of the input size for the problem. And here are some special cases. L of zero, if you plug in c equals zero in that formula, you get O of log n to the lambda. That's polynomial time algorithm. And um, L of one is if you plug in c equals one in the formula, you'll get n to the lambda. That's an exponential time algorithm. So for example, n to the half, if a, if a algorithm or n to the quarter. Some of the early factoring algorithms were n to the quarter. And uh, that, that would be exponential time. And um, as you improve, so L of zero is the best, the goal, L of one is the worst. And uh, I've seen some algorithms with lambda bigger than one, that's super exhaustive. Oh, <laughs> okay, so you don't want to do that. 
Um, anyway, so, so L of a half is kind of like halfway between polynomial and exponential time. Um, so here's progress on factoring and discrete log. Um, yeah, Pollard had a factoring out method that was O of n to the quarter initially. This is kind of at the time where uh, R Cox RSA was initially being discovered. And um, Schroepel found an L of a half algorithm sometime in the mid-70s. Uh, it is mentioned in the paper of Rivest, Shamir, and Adelson, but I haven't actually seen what that algorithm is. Um, Pollard, 1988, came up with a special number field sieve, which was L of a third, but it only applied to special forms of n. For example, um, Marcin prime, two to, the, two to the k minus one. It had to be a special form of n that could be factored quicker. And then um, Lenstra, Lenstra, Manasse, and Pollard in 1990 got the general number field sieve, which could do L of a third for any n. Uh, and then somewhat mysteriously, there were parallel developments in the discrete log problem over a finite field that they evolved similarly as in, in improvement. Um, so it went from exponential to L of a half to L of a third. Question? Uh, so this, this attack, the L of a third attack only applies to the um, discrete log problem over the finite field. It oh. does not apply to the elliptic curve discrete log. Okay. okay. Um, so as attacks get stronger, the key sizes get longer, all right? Um, this is something to keep in mind. Security is, of a system is relative to your current knowledge. And if you know more and your attacks get better, to compensate that, you have a choice. You can make longer keys or you can scrap the system altogether and start over. So, um, so what happens is that the key sizes have to get longer and longer. And uh, at some point, it gets very cumbersome. And then you might say, well, can we get something new? Can we do something different? So um, you have greater computation, storage, I.O. requirements. Um, it come, becomes more difficult on, on, on small devices, too. So this is where elliptic curve cryptography comes in. Um, around 1985, the, uh, Miller and Koblitz independently proposed this idea of, of elliptic curve cryptography. And um, the security is based on a harder math problem, the elliptic curve discrete log problem. And as a result, the, the system is actually more complex. But because you can get so much smaller keys, it ends up being a win. And it's a bigger win the further out you go asymptotically. So as you go to bigger and bigger, higher and higher security levels, the relative efficiency becomes more and more apparent. Um, so an elliptic curve over a field L is the set of solutions to a cubic equation, and you can somehow make it into a group. And I'm going to talk about the group law um, after the set of slides. So for now, just believe it's a group that we can compute with but it's very hard to find a discrete log, to solve the discrete log. Um, so the disadvantage is it's more complicated to understand, but the advantage is it's smaller, more efficient, and the advantages grow as a, at higher security levels. Um, you know, if, if you have an asymptotically better attack, then you probably don't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, 
disadvantage of RSA signature, uh, let's see, what is in here? So, oh yeah, application of elliptic curves, digital signatures um, is one area of application. Um, so the RSA signature, we saw how it works. It's very elegant. But at this point, we're talking about large, um, very large moduli to protect against these L of a third attacks. And so it's kind of cumbersome and slow. The digital signature algorithm was introduced uh, as a faster alternative. Also, El Gamal, Schnorr signature schemes in the 1980s. They are more efficient, and their security is based on the discrete log problem over a finite field. Um, but because there are also good attacks on, on that problem, we would like to move to elliptic curves. So elliptic curves, essentially any, pretty much any algorithm that's based on the discrete log problem can be transported to an elliptic curve setting, and it'll just give you something more efficient, smaller, okay? Um, I think I'm going to go over this elliptic curve-based signature a little later after we've seen the background on elliptic curves, okay? Um, here is just an additional topic, which is, I think, really cool, identity-based cryptography. This is an idea conceived of by Shum Shamir, and you can see it in uh, Proceedings of Crypto, 1984. Crypto is this enormous um, uh, conference about uh, mainly public key or any cryptography. Um, it was, there's just troves and troves of interesting ideas and algorithms in the, in the proceedings of crypto. So this one's a very good read from 1984. Um, and it's kind of an alternative conception of how you might do public key cryptography without any certificates. It's a very interesting idea. So, this is called identity-based, and the, um, he proposed a signature scheme, but encryption schemes have also been found later, um, 15 years later. So the idea is that you want the public key to be directly computable off of a person's name, alice at hotmail.com. From that, I can compute a digital signature. Uh, I'm sorry, a uh, public key. From that information, I can compute the public key. And then um, the private key has to be provided by Trent, a trusted authority. So here's how it works. Um, let's see. So in Shamir's si system, Trent has an RSA pair, NE. Anyone can encrypt, but only Trent can decrypt. Alice takes her name, mod n, say that's a. Her private key is the decryption of her name, little a. And when Trent sees her driver's license, he gives her that. Um, so now a to the e is, is equal to her, her name. How does she sign a message? She has a message m, and her signature consists of two numbers, s and t, and here's how she produces them. First, she selects a random number R. She encrypts R, and that's T. T is the encryption of her random number. Then she sets S. To get S, she takes a random number, raises it to a hash power H of TM, and multiplies that by her secret. And then the verification check is very clever. When you encrypt S, you get the encryption of, of little a is big A, so you get Alice's name. And the other thing you get is T to this hash of TM power. And S and T are part of the signature, so you can verify just from S and T. And, uh, you can kind of convince yourself that really in order to create S and T, you would have to know how to decrypt Alice's name. So it's quite a great idea. Um, very tantalizing. So now, um, one thing that's very, very cool about that is you can encrypt 
to Alice before she ever registers. So that's a nice idea. All right. Um, there are many other public key topics that we didn't have time for. Uh, alternative public key systems include McLeese system, based on coding theory, Entrue, which Jill talked about last night, uh, Anshul Anshul Goldfield system based on Braid Group. Um, also very important to know about is the quantum effect. So in 1994, Peter Shor discovered a polynomial time attack on factoring and discrete log problems if one had a, a quantum computer. So this led to uh, intense interest in quantum computation. You saw beautiful pictures of the 72 qubit. Uh, anyway, um, uh, and also a move towards quantum resistant cryptography. And uh, you've probably already heard NIST is running a uh, soliciting and evaluating proposals for quantum resistant cryptography. So this is your generation of cryptography. You know, you can see, uh, think about the, the, the seismic change every 30 years where uh, look at 1910 where they had this silly little um, hand ciphers and then 1940 when they have this Enigma machine which at the time was very modern and breakthrough and 1970s where we discover public key and now we're at 2018 and we're worried about quantum computers and looking into quantum resistant cryptography. So it's just a really exciting and evolving subject over time, and um, you know you're you're living in a lucky time where you get to be part of it. So um, here is some further reading, and I think a lot of this, if not all of it, might be listed on um, on the web page as well. Uh, so um, at this point, I can move on to the next set of slides, which is elliptic curve background. That's it. This is a slide that's, by the way, free. Oh, so, okay, good. So I don't have to come so back. Yeah, that's this one. next, and this is the laser point. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so elliptic curve arithmetic. Um, this is a very short talk, only nine pages. Um, the elliptic curve equation and um, a warm-up example, the unit circle group. Then the group law, a geometric description. And then this, these last bullets, I'm going to move to the board and do the algebraic description um, on the chalkboard. So an elliptic curve over a field F is given by a cubic equation of special form. Um, so assume for simplicity that we're not in characteristic two or three. Then you get the simplified form. Uh, oh, it ran off the slide. Okay y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are just fixed elements in the field. And the, the expression on the right has to be non-zero. 4a cubed plus 27b squared has to be non-zero. That mysterious looking condition just guarantees that the cubic does not have a double root. That's all it does. The points of e can be made into a group. And that's very non-obvious. Uh, the group identity is what we call the point at infinity. If we were doing things in projective coordinates, there would be a single point at infinity, and that is the um, identity. And you can also look at points over extension fields. If k is, a f is an extension field, then E of k is just the points taken, the identity compared with, com uh, together with all x, y pairs, where x and y are both all, uh, both in K and where they satisfy the group equation. So for cryptography, we take F to be a finite field, and um, there are many applications to key exchange. Um, you, can, you have an elliptic curve version of Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, Digital signature algorithm has an elliptic curve version. Also, several identity-based algorithms have elliptic curve versions. So it's quite, it's 
So here is the motivation. If you consider the unit circle group, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So x squared plus y squared equals 1, that's the analog of the cubic equation. right? Um, you can parameterize it with, with cosine sine, just the unit circle parameterized by the angle. And you can add. So if you rotate by theta 1 and then rotate by theta 2, our group law will just be, let's just add the angles. And that gives us, clearly gives a group. Adding the angles uh, gives you a group law. So uh, on the other hand, we have cosine addition law and sine addition law, right? So cosine, if I wrote cos theta 1 equals A, sine theta 1 is B, cos theta 2 is C, sine theta 2 is D, um, then there's a, uh, you can express cosine of the sum in terms of A, B, C, and D. That's a cosine addition law. And likewise, we have a sine addition law. Uh, well, that's really nice because this, this gives, is just a purely algebraic formula. Given the two inputs, I can express the sum just in terms of the coordinates of the inputs. And why is that significant? Because the first formula only makes sense to me if we're talking about the complex numbers, where you can go around in a unit circle, or, or you know, it's very geometric. Whereas the second formulation, it agrees with the, in the geometric case, but it's, it allows something more general. Now, A, B, C, and D could belong to any field. And this would make sense. They could belong to a finite field. And this would make sense. Um, try graphing the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1 in a finite field. And it just looks like um, a bunch of points. It has no geometric significance. But if you can translate everything into this algebraic setting, then suddenly, oh, OK, I can do this. So elliptic curves are very similar. They have a geometric interpretation when you're working over the complex numbers. But um, you can also find an equivalent algebraic uh, formulation. So also notice if A and B and C, D are, have coordinates in K, then the sum also has coordinates in K. So we're getting the K rational points form a group. And elliptic curves will mirror these exact properties. Um, So here's a geometric description of the elliptic curve. Um, you take a line, and when you intersect a line with a cubic, you get three points. So call those points P, Q, and R. Um, and then suppose, uh, suppose they're all rational. The group law then is that P plus Q plus R equals 0. Um, most points pass through three distinct, most lines pass through three distinct points, but there are a couple of exceptions. The vertical line will pass through only two points. So when you fix x to be a constant, that's a vertical line, you get y squared equals a constant. And then you only get um, two points out. So in that case, this vertical line, if you're working in projective space, it passes through infinity. So you get a special rule there that x, y plus x minus y is equal to 0. x, y plus x minus y equals 0. Um, the other exception is that if a line hits a point tangentially, then that kind of has multiplicity 2, and you only get one other, one additional point of intersection, call it q. So that's a, a case where um, the the line, you just count it with multiplicities, and then you get a formula 2p plus q is 0. And that tells you how to double a point. Okay, So that's what happens geometrically. Um, if you tried to interpret this for a finite field, you would go crazy. So we have to instead do things algebraically when we're talking about a finite field. And this is where I'd rather go to the, to the chalkboard. Um, so I guess we can turn the lights back on and right. There we go. OK. 
Can everyone see over here in this board? I think it's not blocked. So we have a curve. <coughs> Should I have capital A's? Yeah, capital A's. Okay, and then we have two points and we want to add them. We want to add P1 plus P2. And um, so here's what we do. We're looking for a line L that passes through P1 and P2. All right, so this would just be um, y1 minus mx1 equals y2 minus mx2. And so now that allows it, which is equal to b, right? Um, and so we can solve, first solve for m using this part. So m equals change in y over change in x. And here I'd have to assume x1 not equal x2. And if x1 equals 2, we'll have to get back to that later. Uh, and then b is equal to y1 minus mx1. OK? Uh, then um, here is a nice little trick is you plug the line, the equation of the line, into the uh, elliptic curve equation. So y is equal to mx plus b. y squared equals this cubic. And we know this equation is satisfied by x1 and by uh, x2, because p1 lies P1 lies on the line, and it lies on the elliptic curve. So um, this, this holds for all three points on L intersect the curve. This equation holds, because it satisfies uh, y equals mx plus b, and y squared equals the cubic. So when you plug in mx plus b here, this, this holds for all three points on, on the intersection. So we're, we have x1, y1, and x2, y2. We're looking for the third point of intersection is um, So we know x1, x2, and, and OK. So, um, so here's what we're going to do is just uh, see if I can do this right, 2mb. This is a cubic. I know two of its roots. And I'm looking for its third root. Ooh. That was too small anyway. I'll leave that. <laughs> OK. Uh, so the quickest way to find the third root is looking at the x squared term. And the coefficient of x squared is minus the trace. So this gives us a formula, x3 equals m squared minus x1 minus x2. And 
y3 equals mx plus b, mx3 plus b. And now I've got uh, p1 plus p2 plus x3, y3 is equal to 0. So that's the third point of intersection. Uh, but um, x3, y3 is kind of the minus of what we want. So we take its negative to get what we actually want. The negative is where you negate y3. Okay. Um, what was that? Oh, yes. Um, so the, the zero there is the point of the out of thin, right? Yeah. So is that algebraic? Uh, so, uh, algebraically, you'd have in order it it it's really infinity infinity if you're using x y coordinates. But if you went to projectively and you used uh, you know homogenize in in projective coordinates, uh, this is a point where z the only point where z is zero, and then the formula for infinity is zero one zero. So the the this is the identity. Um, to do it really properly, you have to use projective coordinates. Okay. Uh, so I was assuming x1 is not equal to x2. If x1 equals x2, then the cubics are equal. So y1 squared would equal y2 squared. And that, so in one case, y1 equals minus y2. And then p1 plus p2 is just 0, because they're negatives of each other. In the other case, y1 equals y2. That's the doubling formula. And um, you do kind of the same thing, but you've got to find the, uh, the tangent line. And um, let me, I don't think I need this anymore, so we can probably put this, put the screen up again. Thanks. OK. So what, as I was, what I was just saying, um, what, if, what if x1 equals x2? What do we do? Um, so there's two. In that case, the formula, these two would be equal for the same point, where it equals y2 squared. And if y2 equals minus y1, then p2 is my, um, x1 minus y1, which is just the negative of p1. And p1 plus p2 is the identity. Uh, if y2 equals minus y1, uh, equals plus y1, um, so p1 equals p2. What you do in that case is you look for this is, this is the, um, uh, I'm, I'm substituting the line for y into the elliptic curve. I want, I want L needs to pass through P twice. And I'm trying to find the third point of intersection. So what do I mean by passing through twice? I mean that it has the, I want to have a double root. Um, actually, not quite that. That's not what I mean. Um, That's what I had over there before. 
This is um, the cubic I'm making x1 equal x2, so I want this, I want a double root mm. at p, and then I'm looking for the third root. Mm. So in this case, you're actually going to have to solve for m, and I'm going to leave you to do that. That's um, too technical for me to dare do on the board. <laughs> okay. And I will give an example. Um, over a finite field. So let's take y squared equals x cubed minus x over f5, uh, and I want to compute 2, 1 plus minus 1, 0. That'll be, let's see if they're on the, on the curve. Well, first let's list all the points on the curve. Um, so in f5, 2 times 3 equals 1. And uh, 4 times 4 equals 1, right? That's useful to know. So like 1 half is 3, 1 third is 2, 1 fourth is 4, right? That's useful to know. Um, OK, so what are all the points? First, first I'm just going to list all the points on, on OK, well, we certainly have the identity. And then let's just go through all the x's. Uh, x could be 0. If x is 0, 0 minus 0, y has to also be 0. If x is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. If x is 2, 2 cubed minus 2 is 1. So I get two points, plus one or minus one. Um, if x is 3, uh, 27 minus 3 is 4. And if x is 4, uh, 4 cubed minus 4 is six, 60, which is 0. Uh, so there. Um, and this does not usually happen that every x <laughs> occurs. <laughs> That's unusual. Um, normally, about half of the x's occur. Normally, when you plug in x, you, you either get a square or a non-square. This example is weird because we've got a square every time. But usually, you would get a non-square about half the time. So um, OK, then um, uh, let's see. So in particular, there's our point 2, 1 is there, and our point minus 1. 2, 1, and minus 1. We're just trying to add those. OK, so the line is y minus 0 equals m um, x plus 1. I just used a little different method than before. Um, wait, I didn't do this right. Yeah. Oh, OK. I didn't say what m is. m is change in y over change in x. So 1 minus 0 over 2 minus minus 1, which is 1 third, which is 2. OK. So that's our line y equals 2x plus 1. So y equals 2x plus 2. All right, um, so this passes through the three points. Um, and then the, th the third point is m squared minus x1 minus x2, right? That's the formula for the third point of intersection. 
And so that would be 4 minus 2 plus 1. And that looks like 3. And then y3, which is the third point of intersection, is um, you get it from this to, uh, let's see, x3 plus 1, which is 2 times 4, which is 3. And so the sum is x3 minus y3, which is 3 comma, and the negative of y3 is 2. Okay. So even though we can't imagine the, uh, the line through finite fields, if you tried to graph it, you would just get dots and go crazy. But you actually can do this algebraically, the same formula. All right. Um, OK, so that's the end of my lecture today. And, um, and Emily has prepared some very nice exercises for us. Oh, wait, I guess there's one other thing I should do is come back to just what was that um, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. I might want to say that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll go on a little bit longer because I should go through a couple of the public key algorithms, just um, things I've skipped. So I'll go over here. Okay, RSA, um, I'm going to leave Emily to go over that one. And she's going to go through, she has prepared exercises on CoCalc and going through a fully worked example. Um, and we know its applications are uh, encryption and signature. We've already seen that in the slides. Okay. Uh, next, we have Williamson Diffie Hellman key exchange, key agreement, and I'll give you the, the standard version um, based on finite fields, and then there's an elliptic curve version, and those are nice to compare. So the uh, finite field version, which was the original version, um, you have Alice, you have Bob, and Alice has private A, A mod, uh, well, you have some finite field FQ, and a generator G, okay? Um, so Alice has a private A mod Q minus one is private. And she has a public, or not public, but she's going to, she's going to send to Bob G to the little a, and Bob has a private B, and he's going to send G to the B. And now both can compute. The key is going to be some probably a hash of G to the AB, some kind of hash of G to the AB, which they can both compute. Because for example, Alice sees G to the B, and she can raise it to her private exponent, exponent a. Okay. Um, and then the discrete log problem is given g and g to the a. Can you find a? I wanted to do the elliptic curve version of that. One thing. One thing different about the elliptic curves is the notation is additive instead of multiplicative. So the group law is addition, is a, with a plus instead of with a times. So the, the analog g to the a means g times g times g multiplied a times. For an elliptic curve, 
Instead, we're going to add a times. And this would be written as a times p. It's the same darn thing. It's just a different notation. But it's just how you would a different, the group law written as plus instead of times. So um, the elliptic curve discrete log ECDLP is given P and AP find A. Right? And the Diffie Hellman elliptic curve version of Diffie Hellman key exchange is simply you publicly agree on E, <coughs> you agree on your equation and your finite field that it's defined over and a base point Um, one thing a little bit tricky about an elliptic curve is you have to actually know its order, and there's a whole, that's a whole subject, but there are algorithms to do that. Um, they were really uh, found in the 90s primarily, but in the 1990s, so they're non-trivial, but also you can publicly share N, or let's call it L, L is the order E of FQ. Um, and it ideally should be prime or maybe four times a prime or just basically divisible by a large prime. And, um, and then here's the key exchange looks like this. You have Alice, you have Bob. She makes a private A mod L is private, and B mod L is also private, and she sends AP, Bob sends BP, and the shared key equals the hash of A. BP. So that's, um, that's the shared secret is ABP. And uh, this, the share, anybody who sees P, AP, BP should not be able to compute ABP. That's a, a difficult problem. So it's just a discrete log problem on a different group. And the advantage of this group is um, it's harder to attack. So you can get smaller keys. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Emily, and also I want to pass out um, a very, very handy-dandy list of public key protocols. So you'll have a whole slew of them, um, and they're kind of written in a, you can just see the wide variety of, of public key algorithms out there, and in a this is also on the web page, uh, but it's, it's a two-sided sheet of paper. So um, I guess I will get some, I'll start passing them around and you can, you can yeah. start your.